Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode of Justice for All Now. I'm your host, Hannah Zuberi, and welcome back. You can watch us on Muslim Network TV, America's only Muslim focused network. And you can also watch us 24 7 on Samsung Galaxy 19, Amazon Fire, Roku TV, and soon Apple TV. You know, we talk a lot about the Uyghur cause on this show. Today, uh, I want to concentrate on another case, the case of Dr. Gulchen Abbas. Many international human rights organizations have accused Beijing of cracking down on the Uyghurs by sending them to mass detention camps, interfering in their religious activities, and sending members of the community to undergo some sort form of forceful re-education or indoctrination. Now, keeping in mind the Washington Post just released an editorial today calling this a genocide. This has been the Save Weaver campaign's position that this is not just a cultural genocide, this is physical genocide. Joining us today is Rushan Abbas. Rushan Abbas has been a very vocal crit critic of Beijing and has been punished for her criticism, for her activism for her people. Her sister went missing in China almost two years ago and is believed to be locked in a detention camp. Um, the Chinese, she has said that the Chinese regime must be held accountable for its crimes against humanity, which it manifests in many forms, including mass rape, organ harvesting, and sterilization. Her sister Gulchen Akbas is a retired Uyghur medical doctor, and her family began a search to find her. Nearly two years later, they have gotten to know that she was apprehended and sent to one of the facilities that the Chinese Communist Party calls vocational schools. Now, this begs the question, why does a retired doctor need to go to a vocational school? So to answer all these questions, I invite Roshan Abbas, who is the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Campaign for Wiggers, um, to the show. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much, Roshan, for being here and for sharing your story with us. Salam alaikum, Sister Hannah. Thank you so much for having me here today. So I, you know, let's yeah, you know, let's take go back to September 5th, 2018, when you participated in a panel discussion on China's war on terrorism and the Xinjiang emergency. Um, what got you to that point where you were presenting on this panel? My story is like millions of the other Uyghurs. I consider myself blessed to be in this country and in the US proud to be an Uyghur American and able to freely speak about um, what has happened to the Uyghurs. Um, during the April 2017, the situation deteriorated very rapidly and I have been very vocal and very active organizing the uh, One Ways, One Step uh, women's uh, protest with some uh, other Uyghur women and the youth and also um, speaking against the, uh, the concentration camps. But uh, as uh, we continue to see the Chinese regime uh, find a ways to retaliate against the, the truth tellers, anybody who speaks against the government, even those um, who are living in overseas. And my sister was no exception. My sister, Dr. Gulchen Abbas, um, always lived in a peaceful life and dedicated to dedicated her life uh, to helping others. As you mentioned, she is a retired medical doctor. She just returned 58 last month in June 12th. And she's known for her being non-political and a very gentle and quiet person. So after my husband's entire family all disappeared into those concentration camps, starting from uh, 
in summer of 2017. I spoke at the uh, Hudson Institute panel uh, on September 5th, 2018, talking about the atrocity and the fate of my in-laws. Six days later, my sister disappeared and I had not heard from her ever since. Repeated requests from the uh, Chinese government um, for information about uh, her whereabouts. Um, all of them met with silence while they continued to try to smear my name and the, my organization uh, with their uh, lies. So finally, her uh, detention was confirmed um, by Radio Free Asia on the June 2nd, 2020, just last month, after 21 months. Uh, after the Radio Free Asia reporter, the reporters called the, um, the hospital that my sister used to work. Mm -hmm. They had called multiple, multiple times, like months after months. But finally, reaching to someone um, who confirmed my sister's detention. But imagine that it's not, you know, like just some person who works there confirmed. So even this confirmation was not received from the government. Mm. It wasn't made a public statement or anything, you know. And and so she has daughters over in here in the country as well. Yes. And, she um, your family has been in touch with the Chinese embassy. What else have you, had you done in the past two years to find out where she was? No, we have not been touched with the Chinese embassy, okay. but the reporters and the, our government and the, uh, our lawmakers, senators and the congressmen, they have been writing, requesting information on our behalf. We have not contacted them directly, okay. but uh, they just did not reply anything. My sister has um, two daughters and three granddaughters. They all live in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I have been doing is I have been just being uh, vocal. Um, I have been using every opportunity to highlight her case, mm -hmm. highlighting the three million innocent people that being um, imprisoned, and the highlighting China's genocide against the Uyghur people. Um, just to using every platform to to be vocal. So taking, um, uh, I'm going to take a step back. Uh, you have, so this is not your first round of activism for this cause. You have been um, very active even from your student days. Uh, in 1993, you started uh, and you were part of uh, the Uyghur um, Overseas Students and Scholars Association as the first vice president. So when did, tell us a little bit more about yourself. You came to the United States as a student, and is that where your activism started? No, my activism starts back home when I was in, mm -hmm. at the university. Um, I was one of the organizers for the uh, first ever um, student-led protest against the Chinese government. In uh, 1985, we call it December. Um, we call it 12, 1285. That was December 12, 1985. And then again, I uh, participated um, in the uh, organization, served as a vice president when uh, Mr. Dolkun Issa, our current leader, current president of the World Over Congress, when he established students' organization and advocating for Uyghur people's uh, rights. This is back in when we were still at the university as university students. So I graduated um, so-called um, Xinjiang University, the one of the main universities in East Turkestan in 1988 as retaliation for my activism there. Um, while I was a student, I ended up not having any job and then um, I came to the United States in 1989 with uh, my father using his influence, uh, helping me getting passport and visa to come to US as a student. And then, as you mentioned, um, 
I was a co-founder of the first Uyghur organization ever in the United States, which was 1993. And I was vice president of that organization. Then um, 1998, when Radio Free Asia first funded the Uyghur service, I was the first reporter. I worked for Radio Free Asia for more than two years. And I also served as the um, vice president of the Uyghur American Association, two terms. So yes, I have been very active. This, this, so since you all had been active on this cause for such a long time, why at that particular time in 2017, 2018, did um, the government start attacking at the actual family of activists. Had it ever happened before? Um, and what has there been times in your activism since before, you know, during these past 20 plus years of activism that you have been um, uh, punished for your uh, raising your voice? Yes, um, right after I. Uh ended up staying in the United States after the uh, June 4th Tiananmen Square massacre. Mm -hmm. I started my advocacy work then, especially uh, after the Baran massacre in the 1990. I had contacted my congressman then from Washington State University, uh, Congressman Sid Morrison, and I have been writing to the elected government officials, telling them about the uh, the Uyghur oppression, how our uh, occupied land is uh, being um, oppressed by the uh, Chinese government. So as a retaliation, um, in the early 90s, my father was forced to retire from his position mm -hmm. at the age of 59. So usually somebody like my father, well-educated, um, intellectual who was uh, the president of the, uh, the autonomous region, scientific and the academy association, which is in charge for all the universities and research institutes. He was forced to retire from his position. So that was the first retaliation against my family. That's why when um, all this other um, the actions I was doing, especially after the uh, situation got uh, deteriorated, starting from the end of 2016 and the uh, spring of 2017, I stopped talking to my sister. I stopped communicating with her. Only way I was finding out about her was uh, through her daughters, who was living here in America. So I was not contacting and communicating with her directly just to protect her. Mm. But um, at the end, it didn't help. Chinese government kidnapped her anyway. Mm. Mm. Wow. Now, one of the, um, you know, and this is, I, I, I want to ask you this, because this is one of the, even as we do this work, this is one of the common um, pushbacks that we get in the Arab world, in Muslim countries, that this is U.S. propaganda. All of you, you know, Uyghur activists are hired by the CIA. I mean, just this morning I got this e email from a very uh, a big supporter of ours who said, you know, when I share, you know, we did a national call-in day for Uyghur Force Prevention, uh, Labor Prevention Act. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that they uh, you know, uh, someone replied back to him that this is all propaganda, this is regime change, they've been wanting to, you know, all sorts of, uh, this is the most common pushback that we're getting. So I want you to be able to freely talk over here and, and share what your position is on that. Yes, you have been part of the U.S. government, but where does your uh, activism separate from your any positions that you might have held during the, you know, the course of your career? Well, everything you have stated are the uh, Chinese uh, false narratives and disinformation that they're spreading. Um, 
the Chinese government didn't really worry about the, uh, the Western democratic countries for criticizing their actions, the blatant uh, human rights abuses and the genocide. And it states, not that I'm talking about, from their own documents, from mm -hmm. the leaked documents, especially the sets that leaked by the New York Times. Um, the absolutely no mercy, if you remember that. Um, those documents state that they are genocidal policies then. Mm -hmm. So it's not just my words here I'm talking as an Uyghur or as a bias or um, so-called those uh, like uh, uh, fabrications on my identity, <laughs> CIA. Well, if I'm CIA, what am I doing here in America? Mm -hmm. Spying on who here in America? If I'm CIA or spy, I should have been somewhere else doing that. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, this is the government accused me in their official papers in the uh, uh, China Global Network uh, paper. They accused me and our organization for spreading rumors about missing relatives while stealing other people's pictures. Well, as you see, this is my sister. Hmm. Can you see on the screen? This is my sister's picture. This is the picture I have been carrying around for past almost two years, ever since her abduction. Everybody knows this face is my sister, Dr. Gulshan Abad. Yet, the Chinese government can be so desperate and just try to discredit me. Mm -hmm. They are um, labeling me for stealing other people's pictures and the, um, I am the one spreading rumors about my missing relatives. Mm -hmm. So if my sister is not missing, why in the world her two daughters they cannot communicate with her. Where is she then? Why my sister's apartment is sealed? There is a uh, report from uh, someone named Hannah on uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, on, on YouTube, I'm sorry. She actually, she was in front of my sister's apartment and she testifies that she went to Gulshan Abbas's apartment and the, the door is sealed. She's not mm -hmm. there. She couldn't find my sister. So you know why they are doing this? They are spending so much money on the Muslim majority countries and the Muslim groups because they are afraid of the world finding out their true nature because the nature of the game here is not just the, the Uyghurs is at target. China is waging a war on Islam. China is basically trying to um, uh, eradicate the religion from the Uyghur people as the Uyghurs, as the Eastern Sun, is the Eastern fortress for Islam. If they, um, if, if they can pass through this, if they can demolish that fortress, there's nothing that's going to stop China from moving all the way from Central Asia through Turkey to Africa, Middle East, all over. Mm -hmm. their, their goal is not just stopping in Istrukstan. Their goal is to take over the world. If a communist totalitarian regime wants to achieve its goal, what's there to stop them? That's the faith. That's our religion. Mm -hmm. Just like past 70 years of occupation, what kept us? is our faith. Mm -hmm. What kept us from being assimilated, from being completely losing our language, our ethnic identity, was our religious identity. Mm -hmm. That's what that was. So that's where the target is. And the Chinese government doesn't want our Muslim brothers and sisters to find out that truth. So very unfortunately, many of our Muslim brothers and sisters very naively believing China's false narratives and disinformation. That's why we have a lot of work to do. 
Um, I wanted to ask you, so there, after people have spoken up about um, their missing relatives, there has been, um, some of them have had uh, been able to given their cha a chance to meet, you know, on online with their relatives, or they might get sent a video, or sometimes they release them. You know, some of the activists have been, and that's why more and more people are speaking up in the hopes that some of their uh, their loved one would have been released. So, in this case of your sister, has there been any development at all uh, aside, you know, with their daughter, with her daughters, or anybody else inside? East Turkestan, who could, who has had any inkling of connection with her? Unfortunately, no. As much as me being so vocal, mm -hmm. being all over the, the news media, social media, and they are physically traveling around the world, speaking in every opportunity mm -hmm. with my sister's picture, um, still there's absolutely no any kind of communication uh, to my uh, nieces, my sisters, two daughters. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it worries me because I don't see any proof of life of my sister. Um, I sure hope, inshallah, that she's safe, she's strong. But at the same time, I worry for her health and for her safety. Um, what you just mentioned about the other people, you know, many Uyghurs in overseas have been intimidated um, by the Chinese government into mm -hmm. silence and the, uh, not to say anything about this modern day uh, concentration camps. Now it's not just the modern day concentration camps. It is the uh, slavery basically that the China is running in the Holocaust. Um, some people are seeing their families' uh, videos or pictures and they are becoming silent. Mm -hmm. we'll see some of them as active as before. And the, uh, some of them, um, we don't know what kind of communications they are getting. They are still hesitate to come up and to speak. When you look at it, if there are more than more than a million, I don't know what's the exact numbers, one to two millions in Western and the uh, Turkey and the uh, Saudi Arabia and the other countries, uh, of, you know, one to two million Uyghurs, let's say. How many of us are being vocal? Mm -hmm. When you look at three million people in the concentration camps and millions more shipped to China proper as forced laborers as slaves, every single Uyghur living in diaspora, they have either one or more family members, immediate family members or their relatives. But when you look at not even 10% of the Uyghurs are being vocal. Not even 10%. Not even 10 percent. That is so that is so true. Um, uh, and we're going to show and this is really uh, uh, surprising to me as well. Uh, we're going to show the the victims base of uh, that has been collected. And there's about a thousand, 10,000 approximately victims. And there's so many, many more. But that 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 uh, that may be because those are the victims whose relatives are in relatively safe spaces that they have access to internet that they can share these um the, the this information in the database when i opened it up um recently the first picture that pops up the victim is in focus is your sister um it that just gives me shivers right now just to think about that um She's uh, and it it lists her, you know, as uh, her age, and then goes into uh, who all has testified for her. Um, there's a, uh, a testimony of a linguist and a writer uh, from Kashgar who is now uh, living in Norway. Uh, could you tell us uh, what um, his who is he and what is his testimony about? Uh, Abdulwali Ayu. Mm -hmm. Um. That's really nice. Um, I didn't even know that Abdulli Ayo testified uh, for my sister. Um, he live, lived in uh, Urumqi. He, he is one of the um, uh, ex, uh, uh, expats from United States. Actually, he used to study in the United States. Then he went back and he was uh, jailed uh, 
for a few years and he was released and he was lucky to get out uh, with his family to Turkey and then uh, went to France and then from France to Norway. Um, so yeah, that's really nice of him to testify and I didn't even know that, thank you. Yeah, and there's another testimony as well of, uh, I guess this is the young uh, woman that you were talking about, Hannah Bordoff from the University of Newcastle. Yeah. Uh, who's a research student. So, and this is a, and this is a, t a website uh, that has been, um, uh, hopefully you can show this uh, soon, um, that has a collection of, uh, and this is what is needed to, to know that you are not a one-off case or the handful or the, you know, maybe the 10, 100 families in living in Northern Virginia are not the only people. Uh, yeah. Every, I mean, I can say this, every Uyghur I have met, every one of them, and this is like uh, not just here, moving here to Washington DC, in California, anywhere I have ever met a Uyghur, they can, every one of them has missing family members, friends, neighbors. And so this whole conspiracy theory that this is all a web one, you know, like this is like that map, uh, you know, some people have uh, uh, compared it to, um, the you know the weapons of mass destruction that uh, were supposedly in Iraq and this is another way this is another weapons of mass destruction and it's all, all a lie. I want people to be able to go and study this victims database. All these thousands of people who are submitting testimony, names, faces, how, where would they get even that many pictures, false pictures to put up? Uh, this is something that we really, really have to push back and uh, do your own research. You know, do look, look and look at these faces, look at the names. Every it, it's uh, you know they have documented the cities, the towns, the villages that these people are missing from, and it doesn't you know some as young as eighteen to as old as eighty five from all over uh, the region, not just one city, not just one uh, place. So uh, not just one, and, and that this whole thing about, like we were talking about earlier about um, re-education camps or vocational camps. Why are such educated people being put into these camps? Um, you know, pre presidents of universities and philanthropists and uh, people who are discovering, you know, researchers, uh, what are they being re-educated about? And as Roshan mentioned, uh, many times it is re-education about their faith, re-education on allegiance, who their allegiance lies with. Um, so one, uh, uh, Roshan, I would like to, to you to also tell us more about your work at the Campaign for Waivers. Um, what is the mission of this organization and the work that you do? Campaign for Uyghurs, we are concentrating on the uh, raising awareness, educating the general public among the grassroots organizations, just because of what we are talking about here. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk to the government entities or uh, human rights organizations or anybody who's directly involved with China or foreign policies with China, they know what's happening, mm -hmm. but when you talk to general public, still so many people don't know. If our Muslim brothers and sisters living in the United States naively believe the Chinese false narrative, you can't blame the other people who mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the Uyghurs living thousands of thousands of miles away in the other mm -hmm. part of the world. Those Muslim brothers and sisters supposed to be our brothers and sisters in faith in Islam. At least they should understand and speak for us. But very um, unfortunately, they are also repeating the China's false narratives. Mm -hmm. That's why Campaign for Uyghurs, our team is concentrating on the uh, uh, raising awareness, working against those disinformation educate people and try to activate Uyghur women and youth in diaspora mm -hmm. and also the, uh, the youth and the uh, other general public from the local community 
Um, that's what our mission is, and that's what we are concentrating. Um, just listening to what you said about the, this uh, very crucial work that the victims, the victims uh, database uh, people are doing and working with this. Um, these people, I have to, you know, give my best uh, respect and my kudos to those uh, hardworking individuals. Their work is so important uh, to fight against China's disinformation. Mm -hmm. As you said, those the people in the concentration camps, those are not just the numbers. Those are not just three million or this much or that much. They are their fathers, mothers, grandparents, their brothers and sisters, their sons and the daughters. They are university professors, they are famous writers, they are famous singers, and the uh, uh, successful business people. So putting each individual story and they speak for them is very important. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I was being um, interviewed by um, India Today, mm -hmm. and they had someone called Mr. Tangen or Tangen, or I don't know how to pronounce his last name. He called himself an American. At the, at the end of the program, um, I was so frustrated with his, uh, I don't know what to say, you know, stupidity or naively um, believing the Chinese propaganda or selling his soul to Chinese blood money. Mm -hmm. He was defending China and accusing me for being separatist and the, uh, basically saying that those people are supposed to learn Chinese and supposed to get jobs. This is what the Chinese Communist government is saying. And looking at what's happening in Hong Kong today, mm -hmm. looking at what happened in Tibet for so many years, Okay, for they can blame me for something and they can uh, blame the current situation. But didn't we just witness how China can undermine the international rules and they can conduct what they did in Hong Kong mm -hmm. at the front of entire world's watch? Is Turkestan is isolated? Is Tur Turkestan is the, the most further a place that's so far away, the inland city in the world, far away from any kind of body of water, ocean, or anything. And with the uh, mountains surrounding in the three parts, they just block the whole area and they're inviting uh, only the people they want to come and repeat their uh, false propaganda mm -hmm. and the staging up those uh, happy so-called volunteered uh, trainees, just like, doesn't this remind you of how they set up back in World War II when the, the world community, international community started to pay attention and wanted to uh, have uh, uh, investigators or inspectors come in? Didn't the Nazi did the same thing back then? History is exactly repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And what frustrates me is the international community continue to view China so naively and continue to business, do business as usual, enabling China's economy to continue with this genocide, enabling China, China to murder my people. And I think that is that's what something else that people don't perhaps understand how China functions. And this is something that historically people have not studied uh, the long game that China plays. This is not something that is. And I often also think that um, because uh, the way the Communist Party runs, especially under Xi Jinping, uh, what how they run business. Uh, when people are doing business with Chinese entities, they tend to think, hey, it's me, I'm a business, so therefore on the other side, it must be also a, a small business person that I'm assisting and you know, we have a relationship with each other. 
but mm -hmm. you having your from you know you 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 lived under its occupation so you know what it is like uh, so maybe perhaps share that with like what is you know what the how does the communist party operate uh and and how does it operate with businesses like we've done um you know many shows on here about connecting with media like when uh, the Chinese government has media, radio stations or news uh, media, that's directly connected to the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. uh, so perhaps if you could tell us a little bit more about how exactly businesses work, because um, that's something that a lot of people have uh, uh, misconceptions about. So I was born and raised during the Great Cultural Revolution. I was born in 1967, right in the middle of the Great Cultural Revolution times. So from the time I was a young kid, from the time I was in elementary school, um, until I was 10 years old, until it ended um, in 1977, all they do is they brainwash people they indoctrinate people from a very young age. They try to teach people not what it is, but uh, what the Chinese government want people to see or believe. Um, and the, the Chinese government is one of the, uh, the, the biggest, um, the, uh, well, I don't want to get into that. Actually, it's you know, the, the politics and politicians, but. Um, at least the other countries has democracy. They can bring up the issues, they can criticize the governments, but in China, that's not you know, something that exists. Um, the many, the, the world communities believed that the China is actually going to uh, reform itself if they become uh, economically independent and the people become rich, they will become more democratic country. No. The Chinese government prepared themselves when they become strong economically, they are going to retaliate against the West because the entire time that I was there or all my life, I have been dealing with uh, you know, Chinese oppression and the, uh, the government and all that. They look at last century as a century of humiliation and this century is their century of retaliation. So um, the continuing to maintain the friendly trade with China is uh, actually, that's not only a dangerous to, you know, like a current um, world order, but uh, that's going to set what we are going to live, what kind of world we are going to live for our next generation. Do you blame some of these, um, you know, uh, uh, if I look at it from, you know, as an American, some of, we have to be, you know, we're free to be critical of our government here, and we often are. Um, and one of the things that we critique is the fact that we have been militarily expanding and, you know, uh, attacking countries, bombing countries, and now these countries look as China as a sort of balancing power to the to American power. Right? So, and the end game seems to be, oh, you know, there needs to be a balance in, you know, and before it was Russia and now it's China. This is something that, um, it, as you were saying, that in, you know, at, at least in a democracy, we have free press, we can write, you know, even if mainstream media is bought out by corporations, liberal media or independent media is free to write and say and do whatever they want. We're talking right now. Would this show have been possible in China right now or in any of these, you know, uh, countries that are ruled in with in such authoritarian ways? So this is uh, so. But going back to my point is. What you know? When what would you say when when we talk about like bringing up that balance of power? Uh, you know, uh, especially from in those countries that have suffered under um, American misuse of, you know. Well, what I want to say for that is um, they don't know what they are wishing for, mm. like uh, asking for mercy from a demon or the most evil 
because they don't know what the China is capable of. For those thinking about balancing in power and maybe it's better to switch to China becoming the, uh, the superpower of the world, I'll just look at us. Here we are, example, millions of Uyghurs, just look at us. What we are experiencing today will be their future, no matter where they are, who they are, what country they live, and how rich they are, or what system they have. The China, the, uh, the current, the uh, bloodthirsty, the communist regime is not stopping with what they are doing to the Uyghurs or Hong Kongers or Tibetans, uh, or even if they take off, the, you know, they uh, um, attack Taiwan or even take over Central Asia, they are not going to stop there. Mm -hmm. Their vision is the Belt and Road Initiative is taking over the entire world. When China take over the world, they're not just going to allow people to live their simple lives, mm -hmm. their religion. There's not going to be any religion because China is not only waging war on Islam, they are waging war on entire, all kind of faith. Look Christianity. At yes, underground. underground. Jewish people, Falun Gong Catholics. They are announcing to the world that they are going to rewrite the Bible and the Holy Quran, make it compatible with communist ideologies. Imagine that, Hannah. How in the world communist atheist ideology can be compatible with our Holy Quran, with Bible, with any religion that they recognize their God? Because for Chinese atheist government, there's no God. So. And then you can see that in the mosques in 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 uh, in your homeland. Yes, Xi Jinping is God, basically. That's how they want people to recognize him. So, and and this is and this is something that people who have been detained also have come out and said that in the concentration camps, people are asked to say to uh, give the kalama as. And now, may Allah forgive us, but that, you know, there's only one God and that's Xi Jinping. And the Communist um, Party, yeah. And, and the Communist Party, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and that what would, and, and, and it's not hard to understand this for people who are watching, who might be residing in Muslim countries right now, because this is going on uh, globally on Facebook as well, that uh, you have read, uh, th these are not things that, uh, Rushan is just saying out of her own experiences, or I'm just saying because this is coming directly from Chinese sources. This is in directives that have been given out by the Chinese government to make a religion compatible or um, acceptable uh, in, in that uh, region. It will have to be uh, understood from a communist perspective. And what does that mean? Like that means changing the book of Allah, the changing the Bible, changing for whatever, you know, if you're Hindu and living in China, that would mean changing your uh, holy books. So they, they fought, you know. So this is something that, uh, but why isn't this message getting across to, uh, in the world like this is this is something that also like uh, um uh, that also frustrates me it is even in countries where there isn't uh where there's deep love for faith um the, this this the message isn't going through so let's you know let's talk a little bit about that how do we get that message across yeah, yeah it's uh you know many many people and the uh countries and many leaders decide to take China's blood money over human lives. Mm. So how much is the cost of Uyghurs' lives? How much is the price of their conscience? Just last week, if you remember reading the uh, headlines, U.S. Customs and the Border Control seized 13 tons of human here from the prisoners from those Chinese concentration camps. Imagine that, 13 tons. How many the Uyghur 
people's hair is that? When will we wake up, you know? Well, let's look at that point because that's something very true. Like this is a point that we want to uh, drill in. 13,000 tons, if we, like how much does hair weigh? Imagine how many thousands of people and the descriptions that you read is that when the hair is being shaved off, these women uh, stick their whole head in a hole. They don't know who's on the other side and the hair is shaved off and then packaged and sold and it's coming to your local store. It's coming to your local salon. It's coming to your local Macy's. You know, and and people like some people were arguing that these no, we just buy Indian hair or we just buy Brazilian hair. Um, I'm going to share a link over here, um, and hopefully our producer can put it up, where you can see that the hair that is so. This is one of the companies, Amida, that was um, that is part of uh, w which is exporting hair from East Turkestan, from uh, uh, Roshan's homeland. And um, once we share this, you can see that Indian hair is also being sourced from, they're selling it under the name Indian hair or Brazilian hair or Malaysian hair. But the source is your homeland. The source is where we go people, where these concentration camps are. And there's a 78% rise in um, the amount of, uh, you know, hair that has been exported. Um, so hopefully we can share this so we can show you exactly what, uh, and this is, if this doesn't make you feel um, uh, just the terrified, like disgusted uh, and make it real for you, then I don't know what else will, it really. It's, and uh, the fact that, let's talk a little bit about uh, organ harvesting, you know, this, the, the fact that, China is able to say organs on demand. What does that mean? Well, since um, the Chinchuan Guo came over to East Turkestan in late 2016, the Uyghurs were um, subject to mandatory or uh, mandatory DNA collection. Mm -hmm. We were not sure what was that for at the time, why they were forced to take um, medical exam and give uh, blood for DNA testing. Mm -hmm. And then later, we started to hear um, advertising, propaganda videos in Arabic or two Arabic countries. They are advertising halal organs. Imagine that. Halal hearts, lungs, and the other organs. Uh, yeah. Why the international media or international communities or the Muslim organizations are not outraged by this? If you remember, Hannah, a few years ago, there was a priest in Florida said he was going to burn one copy of Holy Quran. The entire world, the Muslim world, went on the streets with outrage and they protested. And that was all over the, the media. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, not just the Holy Qurans, not praying rugs, not any kind of religious materials, but the Uyghur Muslims themselves are being killed. There are crematorias next to those concentration camps for a culture doesn't practice cremation. We are Muslim, mm -hmm. we will practice cremation. Last time, the world saw concentration camps and the crematorias together. We all know what happened. So where is the, uh, the values of the Western democracy? Where is the conscience of the world? Where is the, uh, the humanity in people? So what are we waiting for? I have to wonder, you know, with frustration, I have to, when, I have to wonder whether the number of the people in the concentration camps would have been reached into 3 million plus if the world would have acted early on yeah. when the, we were intellectuals like Yalkan Rosi and the others who were uh, connected to the Uyghur textbooks 
and they are being the first ones to imprison. But the world has failed to act even now when there are over 3 million people in the camps. Exactly. exactly. What frustrates me is not only that, China is getting rewarded actually by being the host country for 2020, uh, 2022 Winter Olympics. That's rewarding China. Exactly. That just tells me Muslim blood is so devalued. There's no value. Like anybody out there listening, that is, I mean, that is a challenge. Uh, I challenge you today. Rushan, do you challenge them today? How much is Muslim blood valued yes. to Muslims? Exactly. Where are our Muslim brothers and sisters? You know, the uh, Hadith and Islamic um, Brotherhood says, all Muslim Ummah is like one body. And if one part gets hurt, the entire body is supposed to react. Well, right now, the Muslim Uyghurs are being amputated from that body. Where's the reaction of that body, the, the whole Muslim Ummah? Exactly. Yeah, when you look at it, you know, we are campaign for Uyghurs just to release a report today on the genocide. Um, the title of the report is, um, genocide in East Turkestan. Mm -hmm. Basically, by waiting so long to act, the silence from the international community, the muted reaction from the international community is the reason China's actions in my homeland in East Turkestan now basically meeting every single um, element every single act listed in 1948 genocide convention, exactly. each of which the China, including China, is obligated to prevent. So will we be able to uphold the vow never again with the real actions to follow? Or shall we sadly witness another repeat of 1938 Munich Pact as all countries around the world um, basically avoided acknowledging Nazi Germany's human rights abuses for the sake of economic trade mm. at the cost of millions of lives. But back then, access to information was slow, so they claimed, and that they easily hid behind their ignorance. This is 21st century. Exactly. No one can claim that ignorance anymore. Ignorance is not excuse for anybody anymore. Exactly. Today, the faith of the freedom and the democracy of our world is at stake here. Now it's time to end this genocide. Thank you, well, thank you so much. We've run out of time. I wish we could continue having this discussion. Uh, th you know, thank you for sharing your sister's story. May Allah free her. We uh, pray for you. And, you know, we keep asking people to take action wherever they are in the United States, we have another bill that we are pushing for, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Get on your phones, call your senators, write to your Congress people. We need to get this bill passed before the, you know, the, the session ends. Uh, right now, your Congress people are on break in your hometowns, in their own districts. You can go and ask for meetings locally. Ask for a meeting for we, your Uyghur brothers and sisters. Thank you so much, Roshan, for being here today. Um, and uh, thank you to our audience. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. You're watching us on Muslim Network TV 24-7. This is the Justice for All Now show. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>